Hello everyone, I'm Count Zero, and this is not an episode of Breaking It All Down, nor the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. This is a show update. I haven't been doing an episode for a while because several reasons. One, I had a system crash recently, and I had to re and basically reimage my hard drive. And long story short, the database that I'd been using for doing the Nintendo Power Retrospectives for keeping track of reviews and keeping track of the top 30... I lost that. I'm working on rebuilding that right now. Um, that's part of the reason why the holdup for that show is because I need that to be up to date and current, or for where I am in the, sh in the magazine for the show, in order to do the next best of the rest, which is what my next episode is supposed to be. So, there's that, and the reason why it's taking so long for me to rebuild it is because I'm currently now basically working two part-time jobs. One is an internship, and the other is for is a paying part-time job. This is also why I'm recording this in the evening, if you couldn't tell from the rather darker lighting. The cinema snob basement era-esque lighting. Anyway, so, a few quick thoughts on some things I want to give. Um, since I'm here, might as well talk about stuff. I finished reading Captain Four Patrol's Alliance. I enjoyed it immensely. I unfortunately did not finish reading it in time for voting to close, uh, in time for people to cast their votes for it for the Hugo Awards. After much deliberation, it probably would have been my pick. Um, but hey, I read kind of sluggishly. I had a bunch of stuff on my plate, so stuff happens. Um, other than that, um, well, the Hugo Awards happened. And there's been discussion after the Hugo Awards about the graying of science fiction fandom, the graying of the of, of literary science fiction fan uh, convention attendees, and how the median and mean age for science fiction convention attendees is kind of skewing older. This is my right. So older. I have kind of reverse things when you're talking to a camera. In case you're doing a show like this, get a little inside baseball. If you're trying to do something... Yeah, anyway. So, how to deal with this? That, that's the main discussion. I mean, just, it's not just, hey, everyone's getting older, and people are getting old and dying. How do we get some new blood in here to keep this going? Because eventually we'll keep going, but if we want to keep these conventions, these, basically, these conventions which are currently have a fairly good turnout but also fairly older turnout. How do we keep them going and as robust as they were more in the past? But you gotta get the younger audiences in. So how do we do that? How do we do this without pandering, without being derisive? Because if we do that, they're not gonna stay. We want them to stay. And so, I've been thinking about this a lot. Because last year, I went to Portland Retro Gaming Expo, which is our retro gaming convention. I went to KimuraCon, which is the local anime convention, and I went to Oricon. The only convention I didn't go to was um, Stumptown Comic Fest. Not just a time and money thing. And to a certain, and so I got a pretty good overall picture of the local fandom community and the age groups that go to the different conventions. And think about this, and generally, science fiction fandom is, has, in the past few years, kind of gotten hip to comics. They were, with writers like Paul Cornell, and Neil Gaiman, and various other writers, um, getting into the, science, the main science fiction scene and writing literary science fiction in addition to comics, or going from literary science fiction to comics and then back. I think, like, the last few holdouts, they go, okay, these comics ain't that bad, but these comics are an acceptable form of science fiction. It's not just for the kiddies anymore. It's a way to, to get people interested in science fiction in a, in a way that it's a little bit more difficult to do before do now with with many of the science fiction magazines no longer being there, so there's not that way for people to get the quick taste of science fiction to, to whet their appetites that you get 
with the galaxy, uh, picking up a galaxy magazine or an if on the newsstand. Because honestly, most newsstands, you, you, you analog still in print, but you don't see analog on a newsstand. Asimov's is still in print, but you don't see them being published, but you don't see Asimov's on a newsstand. It's a bummer, by the way. Um, so, how do you get the how do you get young people interested? And like, think about this. Like, you know, honestly, the of, of the three conventions I went to, Oricon skews the uh, skews the oldest. But Comoricon skews the absolute youngest. There were younger audiences at Portland Retro Gaming Expo, but most of the people at Portland Retro Gaming Expo were about my age, maybe a little older. But about my age range, I'm 27, so late, late 20s, early 30s, early to mid 30s. Gen Xers. Gen Xers, young Gen Y or millennials, or whatever the hell you want to call my generation. Um, but, there's even more younger audiences at Comoricon, and I thought about this a lot, and I went, you know, you really, really want to get the younger audiences? Anime fandom is the way to go. And it's the best way to go. As we look back at the history of anime fandom in the United States, it grew out of science fiction fandom. It grew out of science fiction fans getting together talking about Star Blazers, which the U.S. release is based on Battleship Yamato. Talking about Robotech, which was the U.S. release of, of well, Macross and Southern Cross and um, Moss Beta. And then from there, it was it was in the viewing rooms, watching tapes of shows that were brought that were brought over from Japan, where people um, who had pen pals just tape recorded Japanese television and sent back whatever they animated, putting in the um, viewing rooms, um, buying OVAs and putting them on in the viewing rooms, and from there we got discoveries of stuff like. Um, all sorts of fun stuff. And probably that's also a lot of the, the modern tokusatsu fandom of the... Not just people who grew up on Power Rangers, but the people who grew up on... Uh, not people who grew up on Power Rangers, but people before then who, who knew of stuff like Super Sentai and like Kamen Rider before Kamen Rider had ever come to the United States. Sorry about that. So, how do we get... So, when since the anime fandom grew out of science fiction fandom, and we used to be like this, how do we get back together, and, and why do we separate? I don't have a definite answer, but I don't have get my, my guess. Is kind of shows... Is, is shows like this getting licensed. Now, just to be clear... Stuff like Comic Party or Azamanga Daio getting licensed, it's not a bad thing. Not at all. I enjoy Azamanga Daio immensely. It's one of the I consider it one of the best anime series of all time and a great gateway series. But the literary science fiction fans who got into anime who got into anime were into anime they came for the science fiction and stayed for the animation. Um Whereas and when we got more of the non science fiction stuff, when we started getting stuff like Mason Okoku, and we got stuff like Golden Boy, and we got stuff like, um, yeah, we got stuff like that, stuff that wasn't science fiction or fantasy, those guys kind of got turned off, which is a bummer. They missed out on some great stuff. But that's where, that's where things started grow, growing apart, and like, oh, Google, people going, okay, we're going to do our own anime conventions now, because we want to talk about the Golden Boys, we want to talk about the Mason Okokus. We... We like this stuff that doesn't just have giant robots or spaceships or elves and fantasy or demons or that sort of thing in them. So, we got anime conventions. And fandom is richer for it. However, it's not like... 
It's not like the kid growing up and moving out of the house. Ultimately, I think the way it executed, the way it ultimately, re the result we have now, is something like... I don't want to say a breakup. But... Almost like people moving out of high... Like, graduating from high school and moving apart to moving away to different parts of the country. Probably the best comparison I could think of. Um, and you know, I'm going for, you know I'm not going for professionalism here, by the, way, by the way, because I'm drinking water on the show. How subversive. Anyway. So because of this falling out between the two sides, um... Kind of situation where we go to an, we go to a science fiction convention. There's not any anime programming. You may have like a viewing room which has some anime related programming, but generally not. Um, and so, if you're an anime fan, if you're a younger fan who's who saw the booth in the um, dealer's room at your local anime convention, say, oh, okay, I'll check this out. I, I like science fiction anime. Let's go here, let's see what they have. There's nothing for you. Really, there's nothing for you. Maybe if you're interested in comic stuff as well, American comics, there might be some stuff for you, but really not. And it's disappointing because, particularly with Viz Media and their Soru label, which is publishing Japanese science fiction translated into English, and with this year, our first work of um, Japanese science fiction winning a Hugo Award, um, on best short story, but still winning a Hugo. Um, there are, there, there's potential here to really try and cross pollinate. To basically, to do, to continue my tortured analogy, go on Facebook, meet your old friend from co from high school or whatever, high school or college or whenever. Um, see that he's coming back to town and say, hey. Want to catch a want to get a drink or something. So, how do we do this? And that's the next question. I put a lot of thought to this, and I want it. It's it's fairly it, it's both simple and complicated too. On the simple side, what you have to do. Is you have is if you're running the science your local science fiction convention, and you have a local anime convention. Basically, what you have to do is get in touch with the local anime convention. And say, hey, we're with the local science fiction convention. Can we do a panel and put together a panel, basically about works of science fiction, literary science fiction that you may enjoy. If you like anime. Additionally, doing a panel talking about works of literary science fiction that have been adapted into anime, and for that matter, um, with stuff like Haika Soru, works of Japanese science fiction that have been translated into English and released in the States, whether it's Haruki Murakami's IQ 84 or stuff from Haika Soru, or the English versions of the Haruhi Suzumiya novels. Talk about those. Use those to get to get your foot in the door and you're going, hey, I'll check out these books, I'll check out this literary science fiction stuff, see how it turns out. That step fudge. That's step one. You've got them, hopefully, interested in literary science fiction enough to come to your literary science fiction convention. Because also what you're doing with these panels is to say, hey, we are with your local, to use the Oregon example, the Portland example, we're with Oricon. We're here to talk to you about literary science fiction. We're here to talk about science fiction novels. So that's step one. Now to do this, again, 
You have to talk to your local anime convention, and you have to have people who are both knowledgeable in literary science fiction and Japanese animation. Because you get questions from fans asking, okay, hey, I like Gunbuster. I like Voices of a Distant Star. What literary science fiction would I like? And you'd be able to say, oh, you may like The Forever War. Both of these are, sto are somewhat are science fiction stories with somewhat military, somewhat not, related to time dilation and the effects it has on people being away from home for a long time, and that sort of thing. One, although Forever War isn't exactly the kind of like love story kind of stuff that Voices of a Distant Star is, for example. But time dilation is involved, and it's a vital part of the plot. So you can kind of use that to hook people in and get them reading Haldeman, for example. Um, if you like Ghost in the Shell, you may like Philip K. Dick. Um, particularly the movie version, because some of the stuff from the movie version in terms of doubting one's view of reality and who one is and that sort of thing is a very Dickian um, theme and motif. So that sort of thing. You have people ready, ready with those answers and, and with the knowledge to handle those questions and that sort of thing. So there's that. So you've got them. You've done the panel, and you've got people who've come from your anime convention to your science fiction convention. Now it's step two. Have programming for them. Yes, you have to put a slot in your schedule or a track in your schedule. It doesn't have to be a big track, but they'll always have like kind of like every few hours or something a panel for the people who'd be interested in this. And you can't just re you can't just rehash the content from the panels you did at the panel you did at Comoricon or your, your your anime convention. I'm using Comoricon in this case. It's because the Portland one. You have to go okay. So you have to have content on anime related to science fiction and which doesn't talk down and doesn't condescend and doesn't come across as deriding of the medium. And the key bit here, I think, not just I think, I, I'm confident to make this work, is you can't, uh, also, you don't want to just have the anime convention people do that, though that helps. Because you also want to have some of your guests, your science fiction writers, um, your guest fans, your guest artists in there to talk about it. So this requires some degree of screening, because you want people who say, oh, you don't just want to go, because people say, go to people who will go, oh yeah, I'll talk about anime, and then go in there, and then gripe about anime for 15 minutes, or an hour, or however long, not 15 minutes, but for an hour, or two hours, or half an hour, however long your panel is. Um, actually, if you, if, if you get them griping about anime for 15 minutes, odds are pretty good your audience will leave, enough of your audience will leave, that you'll, that, that, that's enough damage. So just you screen your guests, um, you do this, but you want you want to have people who are your normal normal science fiction convention guests, normal science fiction panelists, writers, and that sort of thing. Because these panels aren't just for the Kimura contract, the Kimura con, your anime contract. I mean, you know, I keep dropping in Kimura con because it's a local anime convention. You don't want just want people who are part of your usual anime convention track. Rather, nah, I can't speak. This isn't just for the anime con people. This isn't just for them. What you're trying to do to get the crossover is what you need to do is then the people who are going to the science fiction convention for the literary science fiction, if there's downtime, if there's a spot like, oh, there's a panel I really want to go to right now, you want to kind of get them to go to that panel. Get them to go, huh. Sure, I'll check this out. I remember Akira. I remember Ghost in the Shell. I remember Robotech. And get them going to that. And this would be the place where you put panel, do panels like... Oh, say, if you did, for example, if you did Kimura Con, if I did a Kimura Con at the anime convention, um, here's literary science fiction books that fans of anime should check out. This is where you do the turnaround. This is where you do the all right, you're fans of literary science fiction. Here's some anime for you to check out. Recommend your Ghost in the Shell standalone complexes, your Cowboy Bebop's, your Voices of a Distant Star, um, 
plays promise in our early days, that sort of thing. So that's where you put, that's where you get the literary science fiction fans who either used to watch anime but stopped or have never given it a try at all use this opportunity to kind of open people up and go, hey, maybe I'll check this out. Maybe I'll go on Netflix when I get home and rent some of this. And pop the discs in my queue or if it's available for streaming, stream it that way or Hulu or Crunchyroll or wherever. And that is how you get the, get the crosstalk going. The other thing to do, and this is something I'm planning on doing, um, hopefully at the time that I'm not able to record as much and do a more polished show, is use that spare time. Um, do fanzines. If you're, an, if you're an anime fan who's interested in literary science fiction or vice versa, do a fanzine. Go to sites like, oh, maybe a web address, efanzines.com. You go there. You look at what fancy people made in the past, and you make your own. There's plenty of open source graphic design software, page layout software. You use that, you make your own fancy. I'm talking about literary science fiction and anime, and you put it on the site. You, you send it to other fancy writers. Because that's the other way. That's the other, other way, outside of the convention scene, to get the rhetoric going about anime as science fiction in a place where the literary science fiction fans will see it. As a lot of the old guard, they read fanzines. And fanzines are cool. I wouldn't be trying to make one and putting my plots on paper for how I would how I would make one if I didn't think they were cool, if they didn't think they were interesting, if I didn't think I'd want to make one. So check those out. And also if your local convention has a panel on fanzines, the history of fanzines, and how to start your own, definitely check out that panel. For that matter, if they have a reading room where you can read other fa people's fanzines, the print versions of them, go there. Read fanzines. Take a look and see see what other people have done, and then try it out for yourself. And sort of spread the love, and see if we can get... Like, yeah, let's go back to that breakup analogy. We're going to see if we can get anime fandom and science fiction fandom back together. We're going to be like the parent trap. We're going to be like the parent trap for fandom. And with that, um, I'm going to hopefully be on some podcasts in the future for Bureau42.com. Listen for me there. Also, if also in my, on Bureau42.com, I am doing reviews every Monday of the Neon Genesis Evangelion manga. I've got them written up through Volume 13, which is the last one to come out in the United States. Whenever Volume 14 comes out, I will review have a review up there of that. Um, follow me on Twitter, at Count0OR. Follow me on Tumblr, at, wait for it, wait for it, Count0OR.tumblr.com. And I'm on Goodreads. I know what I'm reading that's not science fiction. And my good read screen name is Oh 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 my count zero R2. Oh No I'm not. No, I'm not. I'll put the link in the show notes. I'm on I'm on there as me. I'm on there as Alexander Case. So look for me as that. So there's all that. Look for my next episode. It will come out when it comes out, and not one second before. I apologize for the poor quality of this episode in terms of sound quality, picture quality, brightness, lack of professionalism, etc. Next few episodes will probably do better. Again, recording this in the evening because I'm work, kind of working two jobs. One paid, on, one unpaid. Well, one paid, one internship. And also... I'm kind of in a rebuilding stage. So anyway, thank you for watching. Sorry for taking almost half an hour. I'll see you next time.